triumphal entry into Jerusalem. When they had come near Jerusalem and had reached Beth Hagi at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, The Lord needs them, and he will send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken through the prophet of Zion, saying, Tell the daughter of Zion, Look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and he sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, Who is this? The crowds were saying, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Peter. Welcome, friends, to a Sunday that the early Christian church would not have recognized. How's that for a starter? Welcome to Branch Sunday, as some have called it, waving willow branches or olive branches where no palms are to be found. This Sunday begins Holy Week, which reflects on the passion of Christ and for us in later centuries, celebrates the entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. In Luke chapter 19, Jesus weeps as he looks over Jerusalem foretelling the suffering that will befall them. For in about 30 years from then, the temple would be destroyed and the Jews would be dispersed to the four corners of the world. Jesus enters Jerusalem not on a horse, which would have symbolized a military king, but he enters on a donkey. And that donkey symbolizes a kingdom of peace. The people waved palm branches and shouted, Hosanna! But it was not a proclamation of joy. You hear that? The Hosanna was not a proclamation of joy. It literally means, save us, help us, rescue us. Rescue them from what? They are to be rescued, they hope, from the cruelty and the oppression of Rome. So today we shout, Hosanna, save us from what? Perhaps save us from ourselves. Save us from our arrogance and our apathy. Save us from a world that is bent on hurting others. Save us from a world which throws grace back in God's face. All the symbolism was there in the ancient scriptures. David's son Solomon had ridden on a donkey into the city, and like this procession, he had people who threw garments on the ground, they were waving palms. This ancient procession was something that was prescribed in the book of Leviticus. The donkey referenced in Zechariah and in the Hebrew scriptures would have been a testament to Jesus' true intention as he entered Jerusalem, which was a bringer of peace eternal. But that's not how the crowd saw it. Would it surprise you to learn that the procession of the songs, that the use of palms, the procession itself, was not marked in the Christian church 
until almost 400 years after the death of Christ? Would it surprise you to learn that for the early Christian church, this was not a celebration of triumphal entry? In fact, that notion of triumphal entry didn't enter the Christian church until almost 1200 A.D. In the 16th and 17th centuries in Europe, Palm Sunday was marked by the burning of a jack-o'-lent figure. What is a jack-o'-lent, L-E-N-T? What is a jack-o'-lent figure? Uh, the jack-o'-lent figure is a straw effigy that they created, and they stoned it, and they abused it, and they burned it on Palm Sunday as a way of getting revenge on Judas Iscariot, who betrayed the one who loved him. Straw instead of palms. From the ancient Hebrew scriptures to the book of Revelation, where the multitude of white-clad heavenly hosts stand before the throne and the Holy Lamb holding branches, there was a silence over this Palm Sunday procession for over 400 years. Church leaders determined that since palms symbolize victory, and that Jesus was considered victorious in defeating death, it was only natural to include palms together with the prayers in this liturgy. As the years have gone by, priests and pastors over the centuries have blessed the palms, and then as tradition has it, those blessed palms are then burned. And the ashes used the following year to mark the foreheads of the faithful on ash Wednesday at the start of Lent. Uh, I remember so well back out here in our courtyard when one of our employees, Joe Lopez, who shall remain unnamed, <laughs> put too much lighter fluid on the palms and up they went like a giant pillar of fire reaching towards the trees in our beautiful canopy outside. They were burned. Definitely got lots of ashes out that year. Today, millions upon millions of Christians around the world will follow the traditions of the church in celebrating this triumphal entry. But the words save us are lost to antiquity in favor of celebration. Scripture tells us that the multitudes that went before Jesus and then followed Jesus cried out, saying, Hosanna to the Son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And then days later, the multitudes cry out, Crucify him. How is it that in one moment the crowds shout, Save us. And then in the next moment they shout, Crucify him. Many of them had heard his teachings. Many of them had seen the healings. Many of them had had the privilege, the awesome privilege, of being able to be by his side and to listen to him wherever he went. They followed him to victory, only to flee at his death. How incredibly human. How incredibly human. This man, Jesus, brings no retaliation, no retribution, for in the Passion Week, we have a Savior who absorbs the sin and the hurts and the heartaches of humanity. We see that extraordinary forgiveness and humility modeled for us as Christ's life is poured out for us. That notion of being poured out, one of the earliest confessions Christian church. And how do we respond to this kind of love, to this greatest sacrifice? That's what the cantata, I believe, is titled today. No greater sacrifice. The real test, the response, comes tomorrow, or next week, or next year. When the atmosphere of the crowd changes, or in this entry of the third 
millennium when the crowd says, who cares? It doesn't have any meaning for us. I tell you, do not fall into that trap for you a child, are a bought and paid for child of God. And when our world tempts you to fall away from faith and to abandon that which is eternal, do not fall into that trap. Today we are not just playing games, remembering a procession 2,000 years ago. We have the same hope in Christ that early Christians had. We need to embrace the realities of an unjust world and with faith change it. We need to confront suffering and with faith do something to alleviate it. We need to open our hearts to grace and with faith welcome a Savior. Do we love Christ enough to bathe his feet? Pray with him in the garden, to let our bodies and souls be drained with Christ on the cross, who died so that we might have everlasting life. Do we love Christ enough to be in communion with the saints over the last 2,000 years who have lived in Christ, spoke Christ, sung Christ, composed Christ, died in Christ? Christ. No, I think this morning it is enough to say, Hosanna, save us. For that, I believe, is Hosanna's benediction. Amen. Five days before the Passover, the crowd that had come for the feast heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. Taking palm branches, they went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Rejoice greatly, daughters of Zion! See your King comes to you, righteous and having salvation gentle and riding a donkey.
On the evening of the Passover, as Jesus and the disciples were at the table, he said to them, I have eagerly waited to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Taking the cup, he said, This cup is my blood which is poured out for you. Take it and drink. Then he took bread and broke it and said, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the meal, the disciples began to argue as to which of them was considered greatest. Jesus said to them, Who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. Whoever wants to be first must be your servant, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Our attitude should be like that of Christ, who being one with God, did not consider himself equal to God. Instead, he made himself nothing, taking the nature of a servant. We also must serve one another in love, following the example of Christ, for we have no greater servant. Let this cup be taken from me, 
yet not my will, but your will. And a second time he prayed, Father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, then thy will be done. Becoming human like us, Christ humbled himself and became obedient until death. If we then are obedient to his commands, we can be assured that we have come to know him. For whoever claims to live in Jesus must walk as he did, for there is no greater obedience than this.
love to us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice for our sins. Since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. There is no greater love than one who lays down his life for his friends. 